If brevity is the soul of wit, then Twitter might have just stopped being funny. Samsung made some surprising announcements about more than just refrigerators and who makes the best connected cocktails. We'll find out on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1421, recorded Tuesday, January 5th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by FreshBooks, the super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of freelancers and small businesses the tools to save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash TNT. And by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash EcoTank to find out more. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen rate and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show we, where we talk about the tech news with people who are passionate about technology and the tech news. I am Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. It's good to be back. I, I thought that this day two was going to be like less nerves. I almost feel like it's more, but I think that's because I forgot to eat. <laughs> yeah, you got to eat. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I get so busy. I have like a very complicated relationship with food. Yes, and, and uh, we're so close to the kitchen too, and we can hear people eating outside of our little office. But... You think that would be a reminder, mm -hmm. uh, but not this case. <laughs> uh, today we are joined, thrilled to be joined by Lindsay Turrentine, editor-in-chief at CNET.com from her hotel room in CES, uh, at CES in Las Vegas. Here How are you is. doing? This is what CES is like, Wow, hotel room. It's a lot, no. it, it's a lot you know, peeled back this time uh, compared <laughs> to the years that I've been to CES. I saw a lot more people Very there. Very quiet. <laughs> yeah, right on. So, I'm thrilled to be here. This hey. is exciting, all the way from Vegas. Excellent. Okay, so how many years now, Lindsay, have you been to CES at this point? You know what? I was trying to figure this out yesterday, and I took a year off somewhere in there for baby having, um, I think it's been 10 years, maybe nine, if you take out that one year. Not totally sure. The Somewhere in that ballpark. Excitement's still there for you? Oh, yeah. Well, it's different every year. Every year, I suppose. about 500 people say, it's going to be boring. And then we get here and we all go, oh, my God, it's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, CNET, of course, is doing uh, a, a lot of coverage. You guys are always doing some really impressive coverage. Where can people kind of follow the latest things that are happening uh, at well, CES? Well, you know, CNET.com. If you, you want to get it. really specific, CES.CNET.com. And actually, go. we've got this really sweet package this year, uh, which includes this sort of cool overlay fire hose of all of our social media content. Check it out. It's really cool. Nice. Excellent. Do check that out. before, And we've got a, a lot of CES stuff to talk about. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about Twitter. Uh, kind of some big news today. Twitter's been defined by its 140-character limit. Keeps thoughts trim, hopefully succinct, although people are finding ways around that. So what would happen if Twitter decided to go beyond 140 characters? Kurt Wagner of Recode is here with us to talk all about something Twitter is calling Beyond 140. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kurt. Me. Uh, it's awesome to have you here. So um, you you guys actually first reported on this possibility, I think it was last September. What exactly has changed since then? So when we reported in September, we knew that Twitter would, had essentially greenlighted this project, right? Jack had come back as CEO. Um, he, as the founder, was willing to kind of make some big changes that I think other people at the company had been weary of making in the past. And this whole idea of restricting tweets to 140 characters, they had decided in September that was something they were going to work on on kind of fixing or at least creating a feature to uh, give people the option to go beyond that. Um, what we reported on today was that it's going to come hopefully sometime this quarter. Uh, it sounds like March would be the earliest according to the, the sources that we've spoken with. And um, that it would be from 140 characters to 10,000 characters is what they're currently considering. Um, so I don't know if you've ever written 10,000 characters, but that's a lot of words. Uh, and Kurt, so, how many, 
How many words is that? I was guessing like <laughs> God. I was 500? afraid somebody was going to ask me that. Uh, <laughs> I I honestly don't know how many words that is. I I was reading a few uh, articles online today that looked to be around the 300 and 400 word mark, and they were under the 10,000 character limit. Um, so I guess it depends on on how big of words that you use. But uh, I, I <laughs> yeah, think if you're, that it's, you have a lot of runway. If your update is filled with supercalifragilistic <laughs> expialidocious, might be a different story than yeah, 44444. Exactly. Four, four, four. Right. And then there's, of course, there's emoji too. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know emoji. how you factor an emoji into this whole crazy. Well, I, yeah, I think they're a character. Absolutely. One character. They're one character, but you can say so much. That's what's so great about them. <laughs> yeah. So, so 500 words used to seem like just a little bit when you know back in the day, uh, but now it seems like so much, especially when you consider Twitter. I mean, that is what Twitter is made for, and it, it, I feel like it makes me a better writer. I'm more succinct. Um, you know, I I I can use emoji when when needed. Uh, so, so why why are they doing this? Why why would they uh, take away what makes Twitter Twitter uh, and expand it to ten thousand words? Sure, I I think it's a good question, and a lot of people, as I've learned today through my own Twitter mentions, because my I had the wonderful experience of having my Twitter handle attached to the the tweet that we sent out with the news. Um, I've been bombarded with people who are pretty upset that this is this is happening. Uh, they don't fully understand it, but from Twitter's standpoint. I think there's two things. Number one, they've seen a lot of people who who have more to say than 140 characters. And I think an important thing to point out is that these, you know, say you write, you say you use all 10,000 characters. It's not as if I'm going to open Twitter and have to scroll for five minutes to get past your individual tweet. I think the tweets are going to, the way that they're kind of experimenting with it right now, the tweets are going to still show up in your timeline as 140 characters. But if there's more uh, to the tweet than that, you would click on a button and the tweet would then expand. So it's not as if I'm going to be forced to read all 10,000 characters that, that someone uh, I follow has written. But um, I think they noticed that people were taking screenshots of longer <laughs> things and, and sharing them to Twitter. Um, so from a consumer standpoint, they, were, they thought maybe this could alleviate that problem. But then I also think, you know, when you look at like what Facebook and Snapchat and Google are doing, they're all hosting content now from publishers, right? And I think Twitter wants to get in on that game. And and so this would give them an opportunity to, say, host an actual news story uh, from a publisher like a Recode or, or a CNET or the Wall Street Journal or wh whoever it may be. And so uh, I think that you'll see eventually that this leads to Twitter actually hosting content on its platform the same way that Facebook does with Instant Articles or, or Snapchat does with Discover. So, Kurt, I, here's what I thought when I first heard this. Is this just less fancy medium? That sounds, it sounds uh. like less fancy medium. <laughs> Dress down medium. medium. Medium, without but trust Without all the lovely yeah. graphics. What yeah, do you think? Well, I mean, how is this really going to be any different when it talks, you, know, you use your Twitter handle, you're thinking your thoughts right. out loud? I, I, I don't know. And, and it's actually, you, you bring up an interesting point, of course, because the CEO of Medium is also the co-founder of Twitter and on the board at Twitter. Right. And you got to wonder if, if this poses some kind of direct competition um, I'm sure that that has been addressed in the boardroom at some point, but um, it would be very fascinating to be a fly on the wall and hear exactly what everyone uh, uh, thought about that. I think you're right. You know, the thing, the way that people get around this right now is, is they either a they uh, uh, you know will post a screenshot of something much longer, or as you pointed out, they'll share a link to the Medium post that they wrote or the Facebook post that they wrote. I guess the difference is is that, and as Jack uh, Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, kind of alluded to in a tweet he sent a few hours ago, um, where he actually took a screenshot <laughs> of an explanation for why he did this. Which, which he, is a big message right there, just in how that was delivered. But anyways, Totally, continue. yeah, exactly. I mean, it, he, did, he did not confirm the product necessarily, but all but confirmed it. Um, but as he pointed out there, you know, th there's also this ability to uh, search for that content now, right? So... If I put something, uh, say I write 500 characters and, and I have certain keywords down in the 400 to 500 character part, you could still find that tweet by searching uh, through Twitter for it. Whereas as right now, if I just uploaded an image, you would never be able to find it. So I think there's some value to them, uh, probably from an advertising standpoint, to have certain keywords that can be searchable versus me sharing a Medium link where I'm then, you know, they don't know what's on the Medium post that I'm now taking people to. But if I share it all on Twitter, all of a sudden they can, you know, target me with ads because of it. They can make it searchable, that kind of stuff. So they want all the content to work the same way the rest of their tweet, uh, tweets work right now.
If we could just get back to medium for a second, because I find medium fascinating. I think a lot of people don't really understand it. It's used for people who don't otherwise have a voice um, and it's great, but it's also, it's a PR tool now. A lot of places when they want to make an announcement, I know Google's autonomous car division does this a lot. They go there and I think for the average person, it's hard to tell whether that is, you know, just someone's personal blog or, you know, if it's, if it's a news site. Um, and I think that a lot of big companies are taking advantage of that aspect of medium, that it's not widely known what it is, who's, you know, who's behind this story. Uh, and so I think that could be something that Twitter could do different than medium. Like it's, it's not, and I think Twitter is is confusing to some people, um, but I think they could use it as like it's you know it's very clear whose voice this is coming from. It's the person uh, whose Twitter account it is. Sure, I, I imagine companies are going to be do, using it as well. Though I, I I get what you're saying. I'm I guess I'm concerned or or expecting that you know the official corporate account for company X will just kind of take their their blog posts. Uh, you know, it used to be a press release. Now it's a blog post. Maybe eventually it'll just uh, form into a tweet, right? And that's the way that they're going to announce news and updates and products. Um, I would not be at all surprised about that. But yeah, you're right. Obviously, each individual person is not going to have a Medium account, but a lot of individual people do have Twitter accounts. So maybe this is a good opportunity uh, for for you to kind of put your name on on some of the stuff that uh, right now corporate blogs are sharing. This isn't exactly the first time that Twitter has, you know, uh, illustrated a move in this direction either, right? Like it wasn't very long ago that direct messages, uh, that that limit was removed. And I think the initial knee-jerk reaction, at least for myself as an avid Twitter user, was, oh, what are they doing? That's the, that's the, at the fundamental core of Twitter. But actually, in the at least in the case of the direct messages, it's been kind of useful, it's been actually pretty nice to not have that. I think the difference there um, between that and this will be how is that presented to the users, right? If it, if like you're saying, Kurt, that it's hidden uh, behind the link, kind of in the same way that media is, where you have to click the link and then it reveals the player and you get that, and it isn't instead just littering your feed with a bunch of stuff that you always have to scroll through. Then I think people will probably get used to it because yeah. uh, the fact is, the fact is people are already doing this, including the CEO of Twitter. They are already <laughs> taking <laughs> pictures of really long things. And and tweeting them because that's the only way that you can do it right now. I think that some of the public dismay is just, it's like this deep insecurity that people have. They're like, oh my God, I, I, I don't, I don't have time to write that. I don't want to write that much. Am right. I going to have to write that much? They don't. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> it's like being in English class. They're freaking out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It'll I think, be okay. I think one of the most uh, interesting parts, and it only ended up being one small sentence in the, in the story is, um, you know, I spoke with, with a, one of my sources and, and he was telling me that, Typically, uh, in the past, when Twitter has tinkered with making tweets bigger, that is, you know, either like larger photos or, or more text or whatever, you know, they've done tests, maybe not in terms of changing the character count, but they've done tests in terms of how much content you can squeeze into a tweet. And what uh, has happened in the past is when there's too much content within a specific tweet, it actually lowers engagement on Twitter. Because, mm -hmm. and, and that makes sense, right? Yeah. Because if you're scrolling through and each tweet is twice as large as, as it normally is, you're not going to see as many tweets in the same amount of scrolling. So I think that's going to be a key here, right? It's like, how do you give more content without also uh, eliminating engagement? You don't want people, you know, opening Twitter, reading one tweet, taking five minutes to get through it and saying, screw this, I'm not going to keep going because now all of a sudden, you know, they've only read one of, of 100 tweets that they should be reading. So that'll be an interesting uh, kind of challenge, I think, for the company as they roll this out. Well, it does seem like they are really trying hard to 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 find a successful model. And, you know, with direct messaging, maybe that, you know, is just trying to become a messaging platform. And maybe with this, it's trying to become more of a media platform, like you were talking about, Kurt, like being a, a place mm -hmm. where you can read articles. Uh, let's move on to another uh, Twitter story about Paulette Whoops. Uh, in case you haven't been following this story, Paulette Whoops is a website dedicated to archiving and promoting tweets that politicians have thought twice about and then decided to delete. Uh, so we've been following this story since back in June. Twitter cut off API access to Pollet Whoops, uh, and they were no longer allowed direct access to these deleted tweets. And today, Twitter has given them access again in 25 countries. Um, do you have any idea, Kurt, uh, why Twitter changed their stance on this? I think that when you look at who Jack Dorsey is as a CEO, uh, you look at how kind of involved he is in terms of uh, uh, like movements, political movements. I mean, he was very involved in kind of the Black Lives Matters thing. He, he marched with protesters in St. Louis. I think that 
he really believes in kind of holding the government and holding people in power accountable uh, from a personal standpoint. And I think that that's kind of being reflected right here in how he views Twitter and what its role is in society and why Paul at Whoops would be an appropriate use of kind of capturing this, this information. Um, I think originally when they, when they first kind of gave Paul at Whoops the boot a few months ago, my initial thought was it, it sounded very coincidental that it was happening right before the elections because I thought, okay, they want to make Twitter a safe space for politicians to really campaign where if they do screw up, they can delete the tweet without fear of having it live on forever. And so in their effort to make it a friendly place for politicians leading up to the 2016 presidential election, they got rid of this. Um, that was my initial kind of theory. And now obviously it's back uh, with, a, with a new CEO with Jack back in charge. Um, but I think it really ties back to his personal kind of feelings and his personal beliefs and, and what he thinks Twitter should be about. You know, I've always thought that it did not make sense to remove access to this because anything a politician says, say, on the campaign trail, Twitter is just as public as a stump speech. And once something is out of your mouth on the campaign trail, somebody has probably written it down and distributed it. And this is not really any different. And I've always sort of felt like, look, Twitter is as public as it gets, right? If you have a public profile, um, put it out there. So I guess this is more a statement than a question for you, but um, but I think it makes a ton of sense to bring this back. And I always thought it was a super weird choice. Totally. And, and very strange for Twitter to argue, uh, which they did, that that it's part of free speech to delete what you say. Right. And, and I mean, who, who are they kidding, right? Anytime you see, I, I've at least gotten in the habit, I don't know about yourself, but I've gotten in the habit of whenever I see someone tweet something that I know is going to be an oops moment, <laughs> my instinct is to, is to grab a screenshot of it. <laughs> and I don't sure. know if that's re, you know, reflective of me personally or just society <laughs> in general right now. But I mean, these politicians are, as soon as they hit send, I mean, it could be out there for a millisecond. Someone's going to see it, talk about it, screenshot it. Um, so th yeah, this was kind of, maybe that was the other reason they brought it back because they just realized there was no point to trying to uh, uh, keep this content away from people because it's already out there anyway. Well, I, I, I just want to play devil's advocate here. I mean, I think it's interesting, the idea that being able to delete a tweet is part of your right of free speech. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I, I agree with you that, that politicians should be held to a different standard. And it's absolutely true that once they say something, they can't take it back. Um, and I, I agree that everybody should be very, very careful before they post things. You know, we're not talking about what you're thinking about tweeting and not tweeting. You know, we don't have access to that. Um, but but I'm 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 still a little curious of that, about that idea that anyone should have the right to anything that we change our mind about. So I guess I think politicians should be held to this. But do we think that all people should be held to this? Should everybody have access to what we change our mind and delete online? Mm, well, that's an it. Oh, go ahead if you have. Oh, thoughts. I I personally right like as a person. <laughs> no, I don't want. I don't. I don't want that. But, but, I, but I also realize that you know, once you step into the realm of, of as a of a public figure, expectations around recording what you say are different. And I think that there there really probably is a different standard for somebody who's a public figure. And then that raises a whole bunch of questions about who gets to decide who a public figure is. And to a certain degree, Kurt, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this because Twitter, you know, grants the little check mark. If you're in some way public, they have taken on that role. And, and I'd just be interested to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of come into a time where I, I think people have to use Twitter knowing that it's a public service, right? Um, there's, there are places on the Internet or places in my personal life where I can say things that I want to keep private. Twitter's not one of them. Uh, I think that if you use Twitter, knowing what it's all about, knowing especially if you have that blue check mark and you have a public Twitter account, that what you say is is public and it's on the internet and it's going to be there for forever. Um, and so I have, you know, and knock on wood, I, I don't have a ton of, of sympathy for people who, tweet, you know, I, I understand there are accidents get made. A lot of these people don't run their own accounts and sometimes... Tweets are sent by them, but not actually by them. And I do feel uh, sympathetic towards those folks. But at the same time, you know, given what we know about Twitter, 
what the platform's all about and how it works. Um, at least specific to Twitter, I don't necessarily think that, you know, I don't have a huge problem with it. If, ne for example, I shared a, a Facebook post with my family and, and all of a sudden, you know, there was a way for the public to get a hold of that, certainly that's a different scenario. But in terms of sharing things publicly on Twitter, I mean, that just comes with the territory. Well, I Kurt, completely agree with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you put it out in public, you got to expect that it's going to go, you know, live on in a public way somehow and, pro and possibly in ways that you don't expect. So right. Right. Always assume that your mom's reading everything. That you <laughs> <laughs> That's a good <laughs> rule of thumb. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us. Kurt Wagner is a reporter at Recode and at Kurt Wagner, Wagner 8 on Twitter. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, guys. Take thank care. Thank you, Kurt. So let's take a minute now to thank FreshBooks, the first sponsor of this episode. FreshBooks is the super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of businesses, just like yours, the tools to save time billing and get paid faster. This small business accounting software is designed for you, the non-accountant. Now, I was a freelancer for 11 years, and my least favorite part of the job was all the administrative stuff. Let's just say there were lots of tears when it came to the accounting. But getting started on FreshBooks could not be easier, even if you're not a numbers person. It's straightforward and user-friendly. You'll be creating and sending invoices in just minutes. Get paid up front, and now you can request a deposit in FreshBooks. No more covering costs out of pocket or waiting until the end of a project to get paid. Plus, FreshBooks just announced their new card reader. Now you can easily accept credit cards wherever business takes you. Quickly and securely, right from your iPhone in less than a minute. FreshBooks card reader is EMV chip card enabled. That's the new standard in the U.S. And it works right out of the box. Just open your invoice from the FreshBooks app, plug in the reader, and dip the chip or swipe the stripe. You'll wonder why you didn't start with FreshBooks sooner. If you have questions, help is free forever, and you can always count on FreshBooks award-winning support rock stars to go above and beyond whenever you need a hand. Getting started is simple, and it's totally free for 30 days. Go to freshbooks.com slash TNT, and don't forget to enter Tech News Today in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Start your free 30-day trial today, and we thank FreshBooks for their support of Tech News Today. Our next segment is something that we like to call, these are some of our favorite things, you know, like raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. I was thinking we were going to find like pre prizes under our chairs or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> you might. I don't know. I hope. Like I hope. <laughs> so today we wanted to talk about some of our favorite CES things. And Lindsay, you are there. Uh, so you've seen these things firsthand. Perhaps you've touched them, played with them, ridden in them. Uh, what are a few of your favorites? Okay, the first thing that we saw last night at uh, at the CES Unveiled event, which is just for journalists and, and analysts, is the Parrot Disco, which is a drone, but it has fixed wings like an airplane instead of the, the sort of quadcopter style uh, that we're used to seeing. And what, what makes this so fun, and this is really just a toy, by the way. This isn't sort of, it's not for reporters or uh, it's, it's really something that will be sold to the public. But what's so cool is that the camera is right in the nose and this thing, you throw Whoa. it up into the air and the propeller starts to spin and it stabilizes and then it takes off. It can go up to 50 miles an hour. That's fast. Wow. And then you can wear glasses and actually have a first person view of what's going on in the camera while it's flying, uh, which actually sounds to me some combination of exciting and really nauseating. Oh, yeah, that sounds that sounds cool. <laughs> it's cool, though. And it's sort of Love a harbinger it. for what we're going to see at the rest of the show, which is probably just a ton of drones, like a ton of drones. Uh, a lot of them, not this one, but a lot of them with proximity sensing, uh, which is sort of an attempt to make drones safer so that they would run into people and hurt them. Yeah, that one looks like no propellers, but it would still hurt if it hit you. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that flying at your face full, no, full no, speed no. ahead. You definitely don't. <laughs> this one, it sounds like, you know, the wings come off to pack it and maybe they uh, help, you know, they, they pop off if it slams into a mountainside or something. Okay. Um, but... But, you know, it's it's a pretty cool looking thing. So you're wearing the goggles to kind of fly it around uh, partially because it's so dang far away from you and going so fast. Um, is it? I would assume so. And it's probably easier to steer it wearing the goggles. Yeah. than I don't think you have to, but but then looking at a phone screen. Oh, man, I want to do that. That thing is awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so it looks really like cool. you, can, you can control it with an app or an RC controller. That's uh, that. Yes, I believe you can do either. And it goes, you know, it goes pretty. I think it can fly for 45 minutes. It's a pretty long time. That's a that's a long time. Was, it, was there any price on that? That they oh, I don't remember. I don't think uh, so though. Yeah, it does not, not stand out to me, which means no, because I so it's the first thing I know. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing we gravitate towards when we see something cool like that. I'm not seeing yeah, a price like, necessarily. Can I have it? I, yeah, I don't see a price either, yeah. and and I don't think that there is one yet. And no release date. What else have you, you seen? 
Okay, so uh, I know you guys are going to talk about some of the stuff that I love, but I am just, and, and maybe this turns me into a certain kind of person, but I am just in love with the crazy refrigerators of CES. Yeah, there are two, two refrigerators. And, you know, I mean, there it, we've been talking about smart refrigerators for years and years and years, and there's been a lot of eye rolling about them, and I think Steve Jobs made fun of them and said I would never want one. But guess what? There are a couple of good reasons. Samsung just announced today a refrigerator that... It has a huge screen in it, so you can do all your family, you know, calendaring and things like that from the screen. But what I think is a lot cooler is that there are cameras inside the refrigerator, and when you close the fridge doors, every time it takes a picture so that you can, like, you're at the grocery store and you can go back and reference the pictures and see what's inside your refrigerator. And you can also probably see how disgusting your refrigerator is. <laughs> you can see that so the, ketchup, the ketchup bottle is uh, three quarters empty. Mm -hmm. And, oh, <laughs> yeah. I guess I got to pick one of those up because my... That yeah. applesauce is totally molded. Right, yes. I really should clean my <laughs> I'll be throwing that out. It's uh, definitely expired. But, but it's a really cool idea that I think I would actually use. And then LG cool. took a completely different approach to uh, the crazy high-tech refrigerator. Uh, this is from their new signature line. This LG fridge has a door that is, I think it's OLED powered, and it act, it's solid until you uh, walk up to it and, sensor that, and signal that you want to see what's inside. And then it, it becomes clear and you can see what's inside your fridge. Uh, so it acts like a window. It repaints, and that's uh, super cool. And then also you can gesture with your feet, kind of like uh, one of the tailgate sensors and like a Ford where the hatchback opens. You can actually swipe your feet across the bottom and the doors will open automatically if your hands are full. So just Useful. a bunch of stuff to, for lazy people. Yes. <laughs> Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I we're, about me, Megan. But, uh, we're all there. We all I, appreciate I this. don't know. You know, I saw the pictures of the smart fridge yesterday and I immediately wanted one. Um, but then I felt ashamed of wanting one. There's a lot. It's just a complicated no issue. Okay. <laughs> the, and then, you know, are we ever going to get it? Do we need it? How much is it going to cost? There's, there's all those questions. I think that, um, there's a lot behind the CES smart fridge. It's not just a fridge. It's just really like a, a social issue. Where do you fall? Yes, pro smart fridge or anti smart fridge. Well, uh, let me ask you this, Megan. How do you feel about the the car doors that open, like like the like the uh, minivan doors that open without your hands? I love them. Well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> And okay, I, good. You I got would me like right to where have I one. Side. Okay. So, well, I was thinking a lot about this and I just wondered. I'm really glad because you know a lot about technology. You are a tech expert. And so what I was thinking when I was thinking about this smart fridge, I probably spent too much time thinking about the smart fridge. I was like, are they <laughs> aiming this at women who don't know a lot about technology and just think this is going to work the way it's supposed to work and, you know, we're going to pay $3800 for it or however much it costs and that, you know, is is that but but I, I trust you and if you're excited about it and you point <laughs> you pointed out things that I didn't understand like okay well you can see what's in your fridge well great you could also open the door and see but what you yeah, said is that, you're at the grocery that's store one you too can many see steps, you but no you're at the grocery store and that, then yeah. you see what's in your fridge that is important well and the seeing the seeing what's inside the fridge when it's still closed is actually an energy saving thing right um, like I yeah. the reason I love that and I'll be quite honest is because my kids are that age. Where I am having this conversation with my husband at home, where we're like, "Wait a minute, are we? Are these things actually coming out of our mouths? Like, oh my God, close the refrigerator door! Don't just stand there." I mean, it happens every day. Yeah. Right. That's if you true. can actually just look at what's in the fridge, it'd be kind of useful. Now, to be clear, I am not suggesting that you go out and buy this refrigerator okay. <laughs> this year, but I am excited to see this technology come along because I think it's going to be. It won't be very long. It'll be a couple of years until it becomes pretty um, much more accessible. Okay. Well, uh, did you have any other favorites or was that? Well, I, there's a lot on this list and I see that you have some cool ones. So let's talk about that. Okay. Well, I, my favorite thing was the Faraday Futures announcement. Now this is a smart car. Uh, I like this electric car company. They're very mysterious. They're like a Tesla competitor. We haven't heard much from them now. Uh, but there are a lot of things to love about this concept car it, it, from what I read. And, you know, Tim Stevens wrote about it, um, for, you know, your colleague at, on, at CNET. And I always trust what he has to say about cars. <laughs> you should. He's awesome. <laughs> so, I mean, there. what he says, that, that what we really should be looking at here is not like it's crazy, it looks like a Batmobile, um, that there's a slot 
for your phone and the car gets all the information, not just like there's a slot for your phone. It's more <laughs> it than has Jason's a phone holder. At me. You can, <laughs> look, you can hold your phone. No, but it gets all the information from your phone. So there's, there's a, this idea, this war, it's like, will it have Android Auto or will it have, you know, CarPlay? What, you know, is it going to be a Ford system? Like that that may be, Maybe it, your car could be whatever phone you already use. I mean, that's the idea, right? Or am I missing? No, well, that's the idea. I think it goes even a little bit further than that, which is that everything about the drivetrain and the way the handling, the way that the car actually operates, the navigation, uh, potentially the self-driving aspects of it come from your phone. That in a way, your your phone acts as the nerve center for the car. So, you know, you could be like planning your trip, enter everything into your phone. And I think this is how it's supposed to work. Enter everything into your phone, um, decide how you want the car to handle, stick the phone in that slot, and then all of a sudden, the car is just doing everything you've programmed it to do, and you've planned that um, all through your phone. Uh, it's not, I will say, this is a concept. We don't know if this is ever actually going to happen. There are huge barriers to producing a car like this, and it has room for one passenger. So it's not <laughs> like, a, you know, a great way to plan your trip to the snow with your family. But it's such a fascinating concept. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of extra work, obviously, that would need to um, and and kind of groundwork that would need to be there in order for something like that to work. Like right now, with you know CarPlay and Android Auto, like you need a head unit that talks the same language as the phone, and you know it's not just like just having all that stuff in your phone is one piece of the equation. Mm -hmm. Figuring out how that phone that would wherever you happen to have bought it communicates that information over is something entirely. Uh, different. So, you know, there's a little bit of a compatibility issue there that would need to be f figured out. And I mean, it's not impossible, uh, but I like the idea of it. I like the idea because we live our lives in our phones. So why shouldn't that information move over as long as it works? But it looks dang cool. I gotta say. It does. And no, like it a, totally does. It's a nice A lot of car. concept cars, I think, never become reality. I mean, this is, this company is backed by LetV or LetV. It's a Chinese media company. And I guess they have a market value of tens of billions of dollars, according to Tim Stevens. So um, I think we will see more from them. Um, I don't think I will be driving this Batmobile around anytime soon on my way to my refrigerator, um, on my way to my, <laughs> the grocery store, checking what's in my refrigerator. Not opening my, the door. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, so some other like impractical things that I've seen. Uh, the Fitbit Blaze, not necessarily impla impractical. It's a $200 uh, smartwatch uh, from Fitbit. So it's just, uh, it's got no third-party apps. Uh, it's just basically a, a better looking Fitbit and slightly more expensive. Um, what's interesting about this is I think that people are kind of getting tired of hearing the term smartwatch or wearable even. And um, Fitbit's stock tanked today after this announcement. So, I mean, what do you think is going on here in terms of, uh, you know, wearables? Are, are we tired of hearing them about them? Is there wearable, wearable fatigue at yeah. this point? Well, you know what I think there is, is this sort of realization yeah. that uh, everybody was waiting for Apple to make their product. And Apple made their product, and it's a smartwatch. And then, mm, you know, I mean, people have sort of bought their Apple watches and then stopped wearing them. And, I, and so that that was sort of the proof of concept, and, and it's not going that well, or that's the perception anyway, even though Apple hasn't released its numbers. Uh, and I think what Fitbit did was release something that was like, well, kind of looks cool, but is less than an Apple watch. <laughs> um, and doesn't really do much more than any other Fitbit, right? Uh, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually do much else other than look nice, although it's supposed to have an improved heart rate sensor. So I think that most people were like, okay, well, other companies have tried this and it's not been a runaway success. I'm not sure that how this is going to help you, Fitbit. It doesn't do anything particularly new. And I think that's part of the, the issue. Also, it's very big. Mm. That's that's a recurring issue uh, with these wearable devices, and definitely part of the, part of the kind of the catch twenty two of the of these devices is just the size of it, which doesn't allow for uh, the kind of performance, battery, and all that kind of stuff that people come to expect from their devices. So it's it's kind of a rock and hard place sort of thing when you're talking about these wearables. I do I do wonder if we're uh, you know peak wearable at this point or at least close to at this it really doesn't seem like the wearable thing has has proven to be as compelling as maybe people once thought it would be yeah i mean it's a hard to live up to i mean i wore the microsoft band for a while um the new one the band 2 i really liked it i mean it was a better fitness tracker than my apple watch um but 
it wasn't an Apple Watch. <laughs> so I just, you know, it didn't, it didn't work. There were, there were things, it worked great. It did everything I needed to do. But the problem with so many things that work really great that Microsoft has done, especially in the last year, like apps that work great, there's still a few other things that it can't do because I'm not willing to use a Windows phone or I don't even, you know, use Windows. So mm -hmm. it's unfortunate because it's this, it's again, it's this like, you know, which OS do I want? I mean, I think I'm sort of, I'm already locked in. So even though the, the, the Microsoft band was great and felt good and was a great fitness tracker, uh, I, I stopped using it. Now, um, you know, we're talking about possible peak, uh, you know, wearable, uh, but then one, two, three, three of the next four things are wearables. Yes. Well, so so the, it's the, not we, like we're totally disinterested. Right. We, we're, I'm still fascinated. The, the, <laughs> the wearable that I want immediately is the force band. I don't know if you had a chance to see this, Lindsay. Uh, it's the band that does one thing that manipulates your little uh, Sphero BB-8. Uh, so you can be like a Jedi and not have to use an app or anything. You just wave your hand around with the band on it, and then your BB-8 uh, will do everything that you need to do. Did you get a chance to play with this, Lindsay? I, I personally did not, although I was actually parked kind of right next to the guys who were demoing this all evening. Um, and so I got to see a lot of people waving their hands around and having fun. Uh, you know, this is already a really popular toy. And what I got, this is self, a self-serving note here. But what I really like about this is that it's part of this whole conversation that we've been having a lot at CNET about the new ways in which you interact with your technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, the very same Tim Stevens and Brian Cooley are giving their, their big super session panel on this um, at tomorrow at CES. And, and the topic is, is typing dead, right? Like, are we going to be using our voice and our hands to interact with computers in ways that are in some ways more human than, 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 than typing? Um, so I think this is just one more example, you know, along with Amazon Echo and, and lots of other types of interface and input devices that are just super exciting. So yeah, saw this. It's cool. Uh, but I think really more as a harbinger. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is the one thing that I love about the Apple Watch uh, that it really I really believe it keeps me off my phone because I can just look and be done with it and I'm not interacting as much. And that's something that's my goal to spend less time on my phone. So in that way that this um, Apple Watch really wins that. But the rest of the stuff, it doesn't do so great. Soon you'll spend all your time on your watch. Yes. What uh, are your favorite Maybe things? you'll spend all your time on your Huawei watch for women. <laughs> um, so Huawei, uh, we talked a little bit about them yesterday. I'm, a, I'm actually becoming a pretty darn big Huawei fan, primarily because, well, I have the Huawei uh, Nexus 6 phone. And I think it's pretty pretty awesome. Uh, they've been hitting strong with quality hardware, competitive prices. And they keep doing that. They announced a few things, the uh, MediaPad M2 tablet. They also have the, M, the Mate 8 which is a fun, you know, their phone, really nice design, super low price, gets a worldwide release. But the ladies should be the ones celebrating here because the Huawei Watch, which was my favorite um, Android Wear wearable of last year, gets not one but two women's editions. The Elegant has a 1.4 inch AMOLED display, a rose goldish design, leather straps. That's the one on the left there. Uh, and then the Jewel is the result of a partnership with Swarovski with those uh, Swarovski <laughs> crystals encrusted throughout around the watch. Slightly larger, actually, which I thought that was interesting. Slightly larger than the Huawei watch that I uh, wore, which actually is a pretty large watch to begin with. So if this is targeted at women, I'm hoping that the design notes are enough to make that make sense, the fact that it's slightly larger. I don't know. Does this appeal well, yeah. to either of you, being being women on the panel here today? <laughs> what, so do ladies, what do you think? ladies, what do you think? Uh, I will start by saying um, no. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, I will, but that doesn't, I, they look like the kinds of watches that might appeal to some women. Yeah, they do. And I someone. also will say, and maybe this is not fair to my gender, but we, uh, there are a lot of women who love really large watches mm -hmm. uh, because they make your wrist look smaller. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. They do. They kind of daintify your wrist. And, you know, these aren't hideous. I'm just not a big watch person when it comes down to it. And yeah. I, I, I get really irritated when um, something becomes like for ladies yes. because it's got rhinestones or it's sparkly um, or, or it's pink. And Jason, you know what I'm talking about here. You know oh, where I'm going with this. I know. I believe we uh, used to do a show that was all about this kind of stuff uh, when I worked at CNET. <laughs> That's right. Jason yeah. and I used to be on a show together and there was a segment called Pink Watch and it was about this. And it was but basically this was funny all about this, this kind of stuff. 
an yes. actual pink watch. <laughs> I know. I'm, I just feel uh, feel honored to finally get a pink watch uh, after this many years. Uh, okay, so maybe not that appealing. Maybe the Huawei watch for women is not that appealing, although to it is me. fun to say. To me. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand. I mean, by looking at it, I certainly did not assume that this is like, oh, because it has crystals. All women are going to love and want to wear this watch. It's going, you know. Uh, yeah. With their I mean, personally, refrigerator. Not that appealing, but hey, I, at least we're getting more attention to uh, these wearables being made to, uh, you know, appeal to more than just dude wrists, you know. <laughs> so maybe that's maybe that's an improvement. I don't know. Um, another wearable thing here, man, this is almost all wearables. HTC and Under Armour showed off the health box. No, not a delicious container filled with healthy snacks. <laughs> Uh, but it is an interesting um, pairing of technology. It's a smart scale. So it's a whole kind of like health, well, it's a health watch kit. A smart scale, a fitness band that you can do all the, you know, the typical stuff, uh, monitoring your fitness and, and all that. Heart rate chest strap monitor. So, you know, a lot of people when they go to the gym, they put on the heart rate or they go for a run or whatever, they put that on, they can monitor their heart rate over time. Uh, it's intended uh, to be paired with a smartphone app, $400 for the package, it feels like that's pretty darn expensive for this, but I, um, I'm i happy to see HTC kind of playing around with things because I like HTC as a company and I don't want them to go away, although I fear for them. <laughs> they haven't yeah, had such you know, a good couple Yeah, you what I found interesting about this, this whole, whole setup, uh, Scott Stein spent, I think, a week with this before he came to the show ahead of time. Uh, and um, what's interesting about it is that it's sort of a tacit admission that the heart rate sensing on the wrist doesn't work very well yeah. compared to the chest band. And that the chest band is there because it works better. And this is kind of Under Armour's way of saying like, okay, um, if you're really, really serious about this, you have to go this extra step. We're going to give you both. There's like the convenience version and then the hardcore version. Uh, take your pick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I know, you know, just in going to the gym, you see a lot of people with the chest kind of a uh, strap on at, in some way. And um, it really does seem like my experience with the watch, and I've never used one of those chest straps and things, by the way, but um, my experience with the watch has been that I, I just don't know how, how accurate it is. And therefore I don't know whether, you know, it's one of those things where you don't know whether you can rely on it, how accurate is it? So as a result, you end up using it less and it becomes a lot less uh, important to what you're doing. I suppose other people have different fitness aspirations than I do maybe, and they find a little bit more importance out of it, but it's really hard to know. And I feel like the kind of the people who really take fitness seriously are putting, you know, are doing more of the, the strapped on kind of heart rate approach. Uh, to monitor that over time and, I don't know, not be uh, taking a, a chance, I suppose. Yeah, I think the best, the, the band around your chest is the the most accurate. I think the best you can hope for in most wearables now is in terms of heart rate is to compare yourself against yourself. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, if they if they work that well, then then they're, it's good. You know, if you can say, like, I'm working out as much as I need to work out every day. But if you're really training for something, I don't think it's, you know, it's not accurate enough. Right. Um, and finally, something that's not a wearable, what better way to drive than with Microsoft Office integration in the dash of your car? Harman showed off uh, Microsoft Office 365 integration into its infotainment uh, systems. We're talking video conferencing right in your face while you're driving down the road or while you're just riding down the road, actually probably is more like it uh, in an autonomous vehicle, similar to what we were talking about yesterday uh, with the flip out Netflix viewer in the dash and everything, um, further turning our spare time into usable time. And I'm not sure how good of an idea that is, but uh, I don't know. Well, I this don't, is something I, I never thought like I'd see, somebody... by the way, Microsoft office integration in your car. I know. I, I feel like somebody had to try it. I we got to get this out of our system. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And All right. It'll be okay. All right. There you go. There's plenty more. I know that we're going to have uh, more to talk about in the blurbs coming up. But before we get there, let's take a minute to thank the second sponsor of this episode. This episode is brought to you by Epson. Epson's revolutionary EcoTank line of printers for home, for office. Introduce a new age of printing here. It's the new EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer. It doesn't use ink cartridges. Instead, 
It features a super innovative refillable ink tank. It comes with enough ink to print up to 8,500 pages. That's the equivalent to about 50 ink cartridge sets. You're loaded and ready to print for up to two years. Powered by Epson's leading edge precision core technology, it delivers high speed, vivid colors, laser quality black text, plus auto two-sided printing, a 30-page auto document feeder, and easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value with ultra low cost replacement ink bottles. Make it really super easy to just drop them in there. And now you have the freedom to print without running out of ink, finally. Visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home, your office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the new Epson EcoTank printers. Check it out for yourself at epson.com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson for their support. Epson, exceed your vision. All right, and now for... The blurbs. <laughs> we don't have a thing for that. No. So. But this is the, the quicker segment we, we run through. I know some of you have missed the bop, 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 quick news news segment. So this is where we go through this with this. And Lindsay, if you have any place you want to weigh in, just weigh in. Just jump in there. Yes. So, we'll uh, yield. Yeah, we will. Uh, the first story is about Samsung. They held a big CES press conference today to announce TVs and practical refrigerators, or practical, as we discussed before, uh, thought-provokingly thin Windows laptops and a tablet hybrid also running Windows, that's the Tab Pro. Samsung is delving into the iPad Pro, Surface Book Pro world where Pro, as far as I can see, it just means fancier. <laughs> Fancy. Oh. It, you know, our own Sean Hollister said that he can hold two of these in one hand. Wow. So lighter. Yeah. All right. Really light, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lighter than the uh, lighter and thinner than the iPad Pro, apparently, but not as much power, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I didn't read that carefully. <laughs> it's they a look little really cool. I, I think they're not I, as powerful. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the the power is a little bit ramped down, but um, not a bad option. Samsung's got some nice hardware coming out these days. I like their hardware direction right now. By the way, their kind of design notes um, are are hitting uh, well, at least for my for my opinion. Uh, if you were a backer of Oculus way back when, you know, before they were cool and still on Kickstarter back in 2012, you're getting a free Kickstarter edition of the upcoming Oculus Rift. Included will also be a bundle of Lucky's Tale and Eve Valkyrie to get you started. Uh, apparently, I got this thing right here. <laughs> this is one of them right here. I'm going to try and not drop this. That was the this. original. This is the original Kickstarter edition of the Oculus. Tony Wang here uh, was lucky enough and had the foresight enough to jump on board. And he's going to get one of the updated ones. And Which I'm super I jealous. Which I because I think super it jealous. was like $300. And he said he could only play like two or three games. Yeah. On. So. so it was a long, this was a long he, play. He is owed. Wow. Uh, cool. I'm excited. That means we get to play with it yeah. at some point. I, mean, I feel like most people probably forgot that they, they put money on the kickstart. I know, so right? Like, oh, what? When was that? How old was I? Oh, yeah. Oh. And if they had made any sort of, uh, any sort of, like, I don't know, put the line in the sand as far as whether it was a good Kickstarter project to back or not. All of that was removed now, and they get to celebrate, and everybody else gets to cry. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Ford had some big announcements at CES today. First, the company revealed a partnership with Amazon to put the Echo platform into Wink with Sync. So you can now link your car to your home, so you can turn off your lights from your car, or you can turn on your car from your kitchen. Oh, I like that. There's there's so much more to come here, too, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about all the integration, the, like, you drive in and transfer your song straight from your car to your kitchen. Yeah, or whatever podcast you happen to be listening to. Exactly. Tech News Today, Unlock for example. <laughs> right, because we talked about yesterday, there was like you could be watching Netflix in your car and the car would drive around until you were done. But now, like if you're listening to Tech News or watching Tech News Today, and you hopefully you're not just sitting in your driveway right now, you know, if you had your Amazon hooked up, you could just walk in and your Echo would be... Zap playing. it to your fridge. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. <laughs> it, man, in the last two days, I think we've said the word fridge in this show <laughs> more than any other it's word. Said you didn't eat lunch. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> That's true. I am rather hungry. Um, if you were to ask me what my favorite Android device of 2015 was, it's right here. I already said it. The Huawei made Nexus 6P. And if you were holding out for gold, because Google teased it as a color last year during the announcement, wait no more. Google has now updated its online store. Gold Nexus 6P can be yours for 400 
and ninety nine dollars if that's your your cup of tea. I want a gold phone. Your cup sure. of gold tea. Yeah, it's a nice looking phone. I really I love. I love this phone. It's a fantastic phone. It's going to be a hard one for um, for them to beat in the Nexus uh, brand next year. I Maybe think, you should just year. keep it forever and never upgrade. <laughs> That'll never happen. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't stick with a phone longer than a year. I, I, feel, I feel like everything, the cruft starts setting in. Yeah, that doesn't mm -hmm. work for me. Well, TechCrunch reports on a new service called Magic Assistant. That's an SMS service that will complete any task for you if you're willing to pay $100 an hour. So, go. for example, I don't know where your mind go, is going, but one example they had is that if your flight is delayed, they will hire you a private jet, what? that sort of thing. I know. So, you know, I don't use any of these SMS services, but that seems to be where we're going, sort of. You know, I need help. I'm gonna uh, planning a trip or anything. I'm just going, going to text into the void, and someone's going to help me. So I guess this is the kind of thing. Uh, you probably have to also pay for the private jet, I'm guessing. I'm guessing so. Yeah, the private jet is not included. Uh, with the magic assistance, hundred dollars an hour, <laughs> and if so, sign me up. Right, and I'm assuming that it's just legal things, also. <laughs> that's that's an assumption. Okay. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, HTC announced its updated, uh, unupdated version to its Vive dev kit called the Vive Pre. The second gen unit will be more comfortable to wear. It'll have front facing cameras that'll actually allow the room that surrounds the user to be seen, so you aren't walking into walls if you don't want to, uh, and improved controllers. Vive is the VR system that actually does have this, these room sensors to kind of detect where the user is in space. We talked a little bit yesterday about uh, creating a space in your home for something like this. Valve and HTC have redesigned the Vive Pre from the ground up. The official Vive is expected still to see its release in April. So this is kind of like a a pre-official update for uh, for developers. It's a pre-pre. Yeah, it's a pre-pre. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pre-pre. I got actually really confused when I first saw all the coverage yeah, of this. So and I was I. like, wait, <laughs> it's the pre-release in April. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's actually just called the pre. Uh, anyway, I think this is a long time coming. Like, one of the great things about all of these VR headsets just being delayed so long is that they gave the manufacturers, while everybody else was off working on how to film the content and how to make the games, gave all of the manufacturers time to sort of sort out some of the weirdnesses, right? Like how do you not run into people in the room? Uh, so I think this is a great, this is a great move. Unless you want to run into people. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Sure. All right. Well, we have some uh, viewer feedback. Uh, we always love feedback. You can uh, tweet at us. I am at Megan Maroney. Uh, Jason is at Jason Howell. Yeah. Tweet at us, email us. Uh, we got a tweet from Paul, a.k.a. at Sailor Lion. Uh, he sent us a question on Twitter. Paul asks, what do you think about the new Panasonic TuffPad, the tablet that will be running, this tablet will be running Windows 8? And I appreciate the question, Paul. And I especially appreciate you asking me about Windows. Windows, as most people know, is not my favorite operating system. Some have complained that I have a Mac bent uh, the truth is, I really don't even love OS X that much either. I'm hard to please. I know. I just, I really want just to run everything on iOS. That's my plan. But let me get to the tough pad. Uh, this was a device announced at CES today. It's 12.0-inch rugged tablet designed for the enterprise, specifically for home health, transportation, retail, cash registers, small businesses. Uh, it runs Windows 8.1 Pro. I have not used it, um, but sure, I would like to. What do you guys think yeah. about this? Any thoughts? Yeah. Have you seen it? Seems useful. Haven't seen it. Um, pretty specific. Mm. Who knows? I might wander past it on the show floor, and if I do, I will. Uh, I, I will. I will tweet at you. But I haven't <laughs> seen it yet. I mean, anything that's tough has a built-in audience. Seriously, right? Like there yeah. are always people who who are on a work site who know that they're going to drop these things over and over and again. And I think that that's promising. Yeah, I think that's we talk a lot about the fun things and the interesting things and, you know, the things that people would never buy if they were using their own money. But like this is something that is really useful. I mean, the, t the tablet in a work enterprise, you know, environment is really useful and can do amazing things. And um, so thank you for bringing that up, Paul. Absolutely. And let's take a minute to thank our third sponsor of this episode. If you are hiring but not sure where to find the right candidates, you want to hire the right people, but you, who has the time? You're already short staffed. Posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. You can just post once with ZipRecruiter, and within 24 hours, you can watch your candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. ZipRecruiter has been used by over 400,000 businesses, and you can try it now for free. Dan is a happy ZipRecruiter client, and he said the hardest part about running a business when you need to hire is that you have to spend extra time recruiting. 
while you're already short-staffed. But with ZipRecruiter, I've gotten quality candidates within 24 hours of posting a job. ZipRecruiter's website makes this process so much faster by letting me manage candidates in one place. Thank you for the feedback, Dan. Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. What do you think? Should we get to the cocktails? <laughs> Let's get to the important part. So yesterday yeah. I made an offhand comment about how CES is mostly about the drinking so that a lot of tech reporters just fire off a few articles about whatever crazy device is out there and then they call it a day and go get cocktails. I know that's not true with you, Lindsay, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Right? <laughs> it's absurd. It's totally absurd. We don't drink until after we've written at least 27 articles a day. Okay. Well, what if those articles are about how to make smarter cocktails that are internet connected? Internet connected cocktails? <laughs> you know, because yeah, everything is internet connected at this point. <laughs> My cocktail just tweeted from CES. <laughs> oh, that's so, what one of these places is called? It's a, one of these services called Bernoulli. It's smart spouts that connect to an app, help you measure out the different parts of the drink. So you buy the spouts, and then it can uh, measure whether you, you know, uh, how much of each liquor that you need. Um, so I, I don't know. You didn't see any display of Bernoulli today. I did not see any display of Bernoulli today. Good for but, you. Um, but we've actually looked at these before in the CNET Smart Home. We've, we've kind of checked these out. They're pretty cool. I mean, you use a scale, right, and just pour until it tells you to stop. That's the when you make your first drink, that's what you do. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then. The point being, home. yeah, at some point <laughs> you can't possibly here. do this on your own <laughs> right. anymore. So well, it's a good thing you have you a computer doing it. you need it after the third it. drink. Yeah, I don't right. know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, how about, uh, brew? How about the Pico brew the Pico? Pico? Brew? Yeah. yeah, we have actually tested this before. It's kind of interesting. And the, the thing that we've like, the challenge that we've had with this is that it, it actually doesn't take, the one thing it doesn't really take care of is the transition between when the beer is hot and you cool it down. And that's when it gets kind of, um, potentially infected mm -hmm. oh mm. so it doesn't really take care of the whole process for you but it's really cool it's sort of like a bread maker for brewers home brewers yeah they, and then, you know, it's uh brews five liter mini kegs of craft beer um maybe not as easy as dropping like a keurig pod into a coffee maker but you get the grains you get the hops comes with a barcode that's printed on the box that reads the recipe uh to the machine you dump it all in brew takes about a week and after a week's time, serves about 14 beers. So you got to have some time and mm -hmm. you got to, you know, maybe buy some backup beers if 14 is not enough. Right. And if you were, <laughs> if you were uh, watching the video version, uh, we were just watching Allison Sheridan of the Nozilla cast. Uh, she is at CES and did some extensive research oh, yeah. on this. And, uh, I'm sure so. she spent at least 30, 40, 50 minutes at the at the booth to make sure she got it right. <laughs> and Allison, I know be, I would have. Uh, yeah, so we can ask her all about it. Allison's <laughs> going to be a guest on in the, in the next month, so we'll yeah. talk to her on the 19th that, if she recovers from CES. Hopefully so. <laughs> uh, finally, how about a robot that will slam shots so you have a partner in crime? It will actually, you know, it'll, you serve it a shot, it drinks it, it's, you know, it goes down into a. A mason jar, it looks like. Uh, but its cheeks glow red after it drinks. Robots are people. <laughs> oh, that's isn't adorable. That, isn't that adorable? It's, yeah. It's slightly <laughs> disturbing in a robots <laughs> are all... See? Whoa. Red cheeks. It's angry and drunk, though. Yeah, it's not a very happy drunk. <laughs> no, it's not a lovey drunk. <laughs> yeah, get that in the room with some DARPA robots and, mm. you know, you have a party. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to be careful about that. Uh, but we don't need robots to serve us no, drinks. we don't. We have interns and employees of Twitch. <laughs> yes. Oh, and thank, thank you. you. I'm sorry, <laughs> Lindsay. Wow, what is this? Yeah, where is yeah. mine? Well, yeah, where is yours? Yours service. is, you're at CES, so we'll cheers you any. I don't know, is cheers. yours down there? Uh, cheers. All right, there you go. <laughs> Bink. <laughs> cheers. All right, cool. So say goodbye to the robots. <laughs> we have people that'll make you drinks anyway. <laughs> Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining Ooh. us. We will. <laughs> Sorry, that's. <laughs> we have some really young people Thanks working here. <laughs> uh, so we will let you get off to whatever CES hobnobbing you need to do. Uh, what are you working on uh, besides CES or what are you working on for CES that you can Is tell there us about? anything besides CES? <laughs> okay, here's a really cool thing. Um, tomorrow we will be filming and Thursday we will be publishing show floor tour with Brian Tong. Uh, in 360 video. So if you have a VR what? headset, cardboard, 
You're going to be actually able to experience a show floor tour in 360 <sighs> with us. Check back at ces.cnet.com on Thursday. I don't have an exact time yet, but just keep your eyes peeled. It's going to be super cool. How are you recording it? I'm very curious. Do you know? Uh, we're working with a partner. I am 360, um, but, but we're going to be doing a lot more of this. So. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you Come so much us. for doing this. Yeah, thank you so <laughs> yeah, much, Lindy. It's super fun as always. It's great to see you both. Right on. Always a pleasure. Take care and don't get sick. Don't get CES I, I sick. I will not. All right. We'll, <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye. All right. So tomorrow we are going to be joined by the amazing Georgia Dow from Imore. Love Georgia Dow. It's going to be great to have her on. Uh, we did it. High five. I don't, I don't think this is something we have to do every time, but I, I, I feel like right now as we're getting started, I need to high five you. Yeah. I don't know I why. on the left hand. Though. Okay. Let's do that it. works. Okay. All right. <laughs> Cheersing and high fives yes. is becoming a part of the show. Yeah. We did it twice. And I'm sorry. Yes, I know. <laughs> Maybe third time won't be a charm. Don't forget that you can uh, be a part of the show. All you need to do is email us, tnt at twit.tv, or leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Tech News Today records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live with the recorded episode hitting the feeds and tubes later that evening. Just look for the home on the web for this show. That's twit.tv slash TNT. And that is all we wrote. Thanks for talking tech with us today, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, guys.